Hi, everybody. We are here with Jerry Davis, Major League umpire for over 38 years. Jerry, thanks so much for being part of the Coach Baseball Right podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure, Steve. Great to be here. Jerry, our Coach Baseball Right program is all about helping organizations, coaches, and parents transform baseball experiences and developments. We started this podcast to allow our listeners to hear different perspectives on coaching baseball the right way. So with that being said, let's jump into our first question. 1976, St. Louis, Missouri, you decide to attend Al Summers Umpire School. Had you ever umpired before? Uh, interesting enough, I played um, I played for Paul Fultz, St. Louis Pros. We had a traveling team, and I had hurt my arm uh, and couldn't pitch. And uh, whenever we would travel uh, for games, we would provide one of the umpires, and the home team would provide one. Well, Paul said, since you're hurt and can't pitch, uh, you're going to be the umpire. And that, I mean, that literally was so he could save the eight or 10 bucks, whatever it was you were paying the guys back then. Um, I did it and he said, Hey, you know, you're pretty decent. You should think about going to umpire school. And quite frankly, I didn't really even know there was such a thing. I grew up like every red blooded kid. I wanted to be a major league player. Um, but he sent away for the application and had it sent to my house. And it was at a time in my life when I, you know, was able to, uh, drop things and, and go to umpire school. So I decided to go, and obviously things have worked out pretty great for me. You sure have. Uh, Paul was a wonderful guy, and I, I can see Paul doing that, trying to save a few dollars to, to uh, <laughs> and, and at the same time give a guy a start. So that's pretty cool. He was, he was, he was a classic. And, and I tell you, you know, from a, from a coach's perspective, had such an influence on so many uh, young guys' lives. I mean, he was, he was a great, great person. He really, really was. Hey Jerry, what was uh, what was umpire school like? Well, uh, it was competitive. I mean, uh, you know, you go down there blind and, and really know, not knowing what to expect, but it's very intense. Um, uh, the year that I went to school, there were three schools combined, and uh, total there was 303 students. Of those 300, 14 of us got jobs uh, out of out of umpire school, and then uh, three of us made it to the major league. So. It's very competitive to get out um, and, and pretty intense while, you, while you're there as far as studying the rule book and, you know, uh, uh, learning positioning and timing and such. Who were the other two fellows out of that class that, uh, that uh, got to the big uh, leagues? John Hirschbeck, who was in my class, and uh, Tim McClellan. After umpire school, your first job in pro ball, where, where did it take you to? Sure, I was in the Midwest League. Uh, Fortunately enough, I finished first in my class, so uh, I got to skip. Uh, back then, they, the, depending on where you finished in your class, you could skip rookie ball. Uh, so I went right to the Midwest League, uh, umpired there for two years, and then to the Eastern League. And uh, at the end of my third year, went to the American Association and and then to the Major Leagues. Let's go back to the Midwest League. Uh, do you remember your very first ejection? <laughs> uh I do. Uh Juan Monasterio uh played for the uh played for the Mets. They were they were the Wausau Mets at the time. Uh, and um he was from Cuba and a little volatile and uh I had called a strike on him that he didn't like. This was like my third play jobs in in, in organized baseball. And um then he uh, popped up, and as soon as he popped up, he ran like three steps with the bat, turned around, and threw the bat at me. Uh, so, <laughs> so that was kind of an easy one. That was kind of an easy one. What was uh, what was minor league baseball like for for an umpire as you climbed the ladder? In other words, um, was it a different experience from one league to another? Well, I think you know the biggest thing that I say about uh, being in the minor leagues, and this is true whether you're an umpire or a player or coach manager, really what whatever, the one thing you have in common when you're in the minor leagues is that you don't want to be there. You know, you wanna be you wanna keep moving up and and quite frankly back in that back in those days as an umpire the way you the way you moved up was you had to like quote unquote win the argument. You know, you had to either yell louder than the other guy or have the last say, that kind of thing. So so it was a the mentality that that, that you had to win the argument, which was, you know, I mean, it helped me to some extent, but the truth is, is once I made, once I made it to the major leagues, I, I you know, learned a lot, and uh, that's not always how you win arguments. Right. Hey, can you elaborate on, you know, a couple 
fun, interesting moments that occurred in the minor leagues? Oh, well, geez. I mean, uh, <laughs> I remember uh, um, one of the plays in particular, I was, I was working with uh, Christine Wren, who at the time was the only female umpire in baseball. And we had a game in Clinton, Iowa. Uh, it was the Dodgers uh, farm club. And they had, uh, I remember Solskja being there and uh, uh, one of the pitchers um, with Oakland, he was, uh, well, anyway, the, the point is, is the lights were so terrible. I mean, you could barely see the outfielders. And we had a play late in the game where bases were loaded and nobody out. And the guy hit a, a shot into the gap in right center. And Christine went out on the ball, and um, the runners just started running, took off running and everything. And a couple guys scored, and uh, she came running back in, signaling out, and nobody had seen her do that at first. So all the runners were scrambling back. I mean, it was a real cluster. It was, it was crazy. We ended up getting a triple play and a protested game and three or four ejections over the whole thing. It was a real farce. I mean, crazy. That, that happened, and I remember <laughs> in, in Dubuque, Iowa, um, the team didn't. Uh, the team had lost like 14 straight games or whatever, and didn't want to play on a Sunday afternoon because they had, we had a big travel day. So they put all the hoses under the under the tarps um, to, to water down the field. I mean, we got to the field the next day. It was 75 degrees, beautiful day, but we couldn't play because the the field was waterlogged. So, I mean, those kinds of things. Were, you know, everything that you see, like in uh, Bull Durham and all those kinds of movies, they're all true. They all happen. It really happened. That yeah, is incredible. Really now, whatever happened uh, to Christine Wren? Did she continue her journey in, in the minor league? Uh, she she did not. I think uh, I, I, I went to double A from there, and I think that was her last year. Uh, I have not stayed in touch with her. I heard that she uh, moved to Washington and was a UPS truck driver, but I, I had not uh, – I, I have not stayed in touch with her. So when you got – when you went to a league and, and – um, were you given a partner for the season right. for a month? How did it work? Well, it was usually for a season unless you had so much crap they decided to switch you. I mean, you know, it was uh, kind of on the fly kind of thing. It, it, the intent was for it to be for the season, and uh, um, that's the way it usually happens. And did you have a different boss in each league that you went to? Yes, yes. Um, we had um, Mr. Walters, who was a fantastic Fantastic league president in A-Ball. I had another uh, uh, excellent um, uh, league president in Pat McCurran, and then Joe Ryan. I was very fortunate in, in all my minor league career to have uh, league presidents who were very, very supportive of umpires. Um, Joe Ryan in particular uh, at, at the AAA level. Back then, uh, the major leagues, the National League and the American League, had to take options on your contract in order to purchase you. And once one took an option, the other couldn't claim you. So he he scouted umpires. And consequently, the American Association had a lot of uh, prospects that were going to be going to the major leagues. So um, he, was, he was really great, really a great league president. Where, where were you when you were notified you were going to go to the big leagues? Do you remember the place? Oh, absolutely. I, I, it was, uh, I, I, I remember the place, the hotel room. It was 219 in the afternoon. Yeah, it was in Wichita, Kansas, uh, 1982. Um, you know, that's obviously that's the culmination of, uh, you know, your career dreams. So, sure, those are the kinds of things that stick out in your mind. And who made that call? How were you informed? Uh, at the time, the, uh, the uh, director of umpiring was Ed Vargo. He called me and said that I had to be um, in Montreal for the following the day, the following game. And interesting enough, they were playing the Cardinals. You know, my being from St. Louis uh, was, uh, you know, it was a very special day. Uh, that's awesome. Um, so your first major league was the Expos and the Cardinals. Yes. And you remember your uh, your partners that day? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and another thing to show you to show you how old I am, I guess. Um, I went in uh, because Doug Harvey's father was ill, and Doug Harvey had no leave. So that tells you how long ago it was. But my wow. partners were uh, Frank Coley, Nick Colosi, and Jerry Crawford. Uh, and a little antidote to that, um, I worked third base, and my first call was like in the fourth or fifth inning. I called somebody out at third base, and it was the last out of the inning. And back then, they just rolled the ball to the mound 
uh, Jerry Crawford was umpiring first base, and and he went in from first base, got the ball, and and rolled it over to me. So it was my first call in the major leagues. I still have the baseball from. Oh, oh that's neat. Now is he he still umpiring? He's not. He's retired now. And how long has he been retired? Uh, I would guess four years, maybe. Uh, it, that would be a guess, four or five years. Yeah. And, and was Jerry? Is he the son of Shax Crawford? That's right. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He. Uh, they have a real officiating family because Jerry's brother Joey was a, a longtime uh, Hall of Fame type uh, referee in the, from the National Basketball Association. Now, can you tell me? Uh, pick out some highlights. Something that that in your career really stands out. Oh well. Uh, obviously, before, you know, my first game, I'll, I'll remember forever and stuff. My first World Series was was. Um, Obviously, one that I refer to a lot. That was in 1996. And that was the uh, uh, the Yankees and the Braves. Um, the Braves won the first two games in New York, and then we're headed back um, to Atlanta. Uh, so you know, the feeling was this series is pretty much over because the Braves had you know unbelievable pitching back then and stuff. And the other thing that was a factor back then was that the rotation was different than it is now. The rotation was on, on seniority and it was reverse seniority. So I, I was the youngest guy on the crew and scheduled to work game six. Um, so um, obviously the Yankees won the first, the, those three games um, at, um, at Atlanta and we had to go back, we had to go back to New York. So I had to work game six, but it was uh, uh, obviously something that stands out. I mean, it's, it's, Remember for a lifetime. That's neat. Any any particular crazy things happen in that World Series? Uh, let's see. Um, one of the things that comes to mind is I, I know that uh, uh, Cox was really unhappy with Tim Walkie with his strike zone, and uh, when and the next night, Tim was working right field, and you know we work a four man system during the, during the season, six man system completely different. There's a pop up over by first base, you know, between first base and the right fielder. And Tim has been, go, you know, navigating his way between the second baseman um, and the first baseman and the right fielder coming from behind ran into him and would have had a chance to catch it. So Cox went all nuts again and everything. But that, that was, you know. <laughs> Part of the game. It wasn't, it wasn't good, but at least uh, the Braves won that game at least. Hey, you know when you when you do something this long and it's it's not an easy thing to do. There's got to be some difficult moments that you experience. Would you mind sharing a few of those with us? Well, well, sure. I mean, it, I mean, regardless of the uh, persona that we, you know, we that we try to to emit, the truth is is that you know we we miss plays. We're human. Uh, the most difficult thing, obviously, of our job is the travel. I mean, we do 120 games a year, uh, which in and of itself is difficult. But when you combine that, that's every three or four, you know, that's three or four days at a time before you travel. And anyone who travels for a living, I mean, anyone who thinks traveling is, is glamorous doesn't have to travel for a living. I mean, you know, unlike the players who have charters, we have, we fly commercially. So we're, we're involved in all those flight delays and the room reservations being screwed up and, you know, the, we're human, you know, and, and, and those things make it really difficult. The idea of, of all the travel and being away from their families is very difficult. Have you ever arrived at a, a site uh, and, and didn't have your equipment? Uh, yes, actually, uh, that happened to us in Philadelphia. And, and uh, you know, we kind of put a hodgepodge together and stuff with some dark pants and things like that. I mean, it's, it's really amazing with all the travel that we do that it doesn't happen more frequently. Uh, and only until like maybe I want to say six or seven years ago, uh, we didn't have any extra uniforms. Now at least there's an extra trunk there that you know has has several uniforms in it, so we can try to patchwork things together. But back in the day, we just had, we just had to had to makeshift our own. You know, Jerry, when you when you think about your career and, and, and like most officials, there's there's always guys along the way that that seem to help you um, from the the umpiring ranks. Who were the guys that you would you would say, hey, these fellows really had a special place in, in your in your career? 
sure. Um, well, uh, all three were crew chiefs. Um, uh, the first was Bruce Fermi. Uh, Bruce, uh, quote unquote, discovered me at, at Vero Beach when I was in A ball, working on one of the backfields. I mean, he, they were they were scheduled to do the major league game there at one o'clock, and we had a game at eleven on one of the backfields, and he came back and watched. I was working the plate, and um, he was influential in, in my being looked at by the National League. Um, then, um, you know, and, and I kind of adapted, uh, uh, adopted, I should say, uh, uh, Bruce's way of umpiring. I mean, I was a real red ass in the minor leagues and, and yelled and stuff like that. And, but then when I made it to the major leagues, I was fortunate enough to work with Doug Harvey for a long time, and Doug's philosophy was different. His his was to let your, your work, you know, speak for you. And um, so, so now I think I'm a little bit of a combination of the two. Uh, and the other crew chief that comes to mind is Terry Tata. Terry was a, uh, and still is a really class guy that, that uh, loved the profession. Um, we did a lot of, a lot of dining and uh, uh, seeing sites and things like that and stuff. So I, I'd say those three probably had the most influence on me. Hey, when you go to spring training uh, or when umpires go to spring training, what's spring training like for an umpire compared to a player? I mean, what do you uh, do down there? Do you have to do anything special to get ready, or are you just go out and umpire games? We just go and do the games. Uh, now, if you have we, – we have our meetings coming up uh, the 22nd through 25th of, of January, and if, um, if there's – you know, if you're nicked up or bruised or whatever, anything that you might have wrong, uh, they have a – a rehab facility. I go to Arizona every year. They have a rehab facility there and in Florida where the umpires can go there in the mornings before their games if they need to. Uh, but generally speaking, you go there, you do the games. I I uh, stay in Scottsdale, so, and because of seniority, uh, probably have uh, the least amount of travel. I, I Most of my games are in the vicinity where, you know, it's less than 35, 45 minutes to my games. Um, and the thing that's nice too is that the vast majority of our games are day games during spring training. So, you know, you get to live like a regular human during the spring and go to dinner and things like that. Hey, during the, during the baseball season, um, you live out in San Diego. Is that correct? I live in Huntington beach. Uh, it's uh, between Los Angeles and San Diego. Yeah. So how many, how many games can you work within driving distance of your home? Well, um, what, that's one of the things that is another advantage because of seniority. We uh, we bid on our schedules in its entirety by crew chief seniority. Uh, so consequently, I bid on schedules that have a lot of games in, um, in for Dodgers, Angels, and Padres. So I, I'm going to get an extra, you know, two or three series probably in each city uh, for that reason because it's you know I mean it's less travel and. It, it's it's nice to put your head on your own own, own pillow, you know, instead of being on, on the road. So that takes me to this question: If you're on the road, okay, you're you're in the middle of a long uh, road trip, so to speak. What's a what's a typical day like for a major league umpire who's got an evening game? Well, um, actually, most most of our days uh, revolve around around the travel. We're either traveling into the city. Are uh, preparing and making sure uh, our flights are all copacetic and stuff to fly out of the city. Uh, when it's you know mid series or whatever, um, a lot of guys play golf, a lot of guys work out, uh, a lot of guys play tourists. I mean, uh, you know the general kind of thing that you would expect. Um, we uh, have to be at the ballpark like maybe an hour fifteen to an hour and a half before game time, um, but that's it. You know that's it during the season. Now let's talk a little bit about that that strike zone. Um, when we when we when we watch a game on TV now, we have a, a strike zone box, so to speak, uh, and I guess it's pretty much for for almost any game that we see. First of all, would you say that that box, the one that the fans see, um, is it accurate? Absolutely not. And I think the uh, I think the vast majority of the fans and uh, even even the players to a great extent now realize that that's not the case. Um, that's a uh, a one dimensional square on the on on there. It's, it's not three dimensional at all. And you know the the rule is if any part touches touches any part any part of the ball touches any part of the plate, 
and you can't tell that in one dimension. So when you guys are actually graded, what kind of a system are you? I'm assuming you guys are graded on on every pitch. Uh, what yeah. kind of a system yeah. do, do you, does Major League Baseball use? Uh, they have their own system that is three dimensional. There are, um, geez, I want to. I'm guessing, but I want to say like six different camera angles uh, that they use during, so they can uh, calibrate all of that, and uh, we're graded on every pitch. And um, the interesting thing is that. Um, you know, we're fr- from the worst umpire to the be- to the best umpire as far as accuracy is concerned. Um, there's less than one percentage point of difference. Uh, wow. One of the thing one of the things that uh, MLB wanted to com- wanted to accomplish by combining the staffs was to uh, uniform our strike zone, and I don't think there's any question that they've done that. So that, um, relatively speaking, when uh, when a pitch is a strike in the in the uh, third inning on Tuesday, it's going to be a strike in the seventh inning on Friday. You know that that's the intent behind it, and I think for the most part they've accomplished that. When, but when you know the thing, the thing is, the thing is, Steve, is that uh, you know as as we well know, um, I may miss a pitch uh, in the third inning, and it doesn't have the same bearing on the game that something that's in the bottom of the ninth. You know, so right. you may miss the same number of pitches, but when you miss them, you know, it's a factor as well. So in a typical game, what do you what do you think you see? Three hundred pitches a game, more or less? Yeah. Three hundred, yeah. That's the average. Okay. Yeah. So to to have a, a good night, um what would what would a good night be for a major league umpire? You know, uh, uh, how many of those are you gonna get right? Well if 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 you're we this is a, a Z it's a Z E system. If your Z E system is below Ninety-six percent. Uh, you're not very happy. And and the typical. I mean, do you know before you even look at the uh, using the tool oh. that they provide? Do you know you've had a a great night? You know you've had a night that you you wished you had a few more back. Sure you do. Absolutely you do. I mean we're human. We're going to make mistakes, and 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 you're aware when that happens for sure. Let's talk about instant replay. Uh, how how do umpires feel about about replay, uh, I think if you uh, if you were to sur- survey the guys, the vast majority would be would be pleased with it. Um, I think that it's you know the, the the main thing from our perspective is we want to get it right. Uh, we don't want to play named after us. Okay, everybody, obviously, uh, everybody knows about the Don Dinkinger play. All right, everybody knows about the Jim Joyce play or the Richie Garcia play. You know, I want I don't want to play to be named after me. <laughs> you know, and right. while while that is still possible, um, it's you know the the likelihood does decrease because because of replay. I mean, Dinkinger is a perfect example. Um, I mean, Don was one of the one of the all time great umpires we ever had, and um, you know he's re- he's remembered obviously for the play in, in St. Louis in 1985. Well, six years later, he worked Game Seven behind the plate in '91 with the one nothing game between Smoltz and Jack Morris um, was phenomenal, and and unless you were an umpire, you don't remember that at all. Uh, I mean, I've been, you know, I've been to dinner and out with Don a number of times, and and whenever he's introduced, you know, it's hey, aren't you the guy? You know, and and that's something that he's got to live with, you know, uh, forever. Um, when you know the truth, the truth is, is uh, he was one of the best we ever had.
This podcast is powered by E3 Consultants Group. E3 wants to awaken the inner entrepreneur in anyone who is ready to take control of their financial picture. E3's family office model is prepared to serve individuals, families, and business owners with the right mindset, regardless of your net worth. E3 Consultants Group believes it's time for a new age of enlightenment. People need people to take responsibility for their financial well-being. The problem rests with inactivity, in sitting back and doing nothing. Essentially, we've allowed an entitlement society to overtake our ability to succeed or fail on our own merits. If you are ready to equip yourself with the knowledge and strategies to break out of this cycle and take your financial picture to the next level, then E3's business model is ready to assist you in thinking differently. Hey, can you explain uh, if you are an when, entrepreneur, when the empires put on their headsets who is helping you and they go to, the next to, level? to New York, um, can you explain Are there financial like, roadblocks how it works, the room up there and, and where the umpires, what, what they're doing, how many umpires are out there, and, is all about the, optimizing the communication the between the guys on the field capital. and the guys in Whether the yard. Can you go through that cash process? Flow awareness, but, income uh, tax well, strategies, all, business codes, consulting, uh, in privatized the banking strategies, uh, wealth E3. management, or and, asset protection, E3 is ready to take your mindset from worry to wealth to worthiness. And John Moriarty, when, the founder and president a, a of E3, is a longtime supporter of Coach Baseball Right. To another umpire, so you never Visit have, their website, you know, www.e3cg.com uh, so or www.e3wealth.com. Or contact John Moriarty directly at 314-805-9349. They have to learn more. Angles. They have Tell them Coach Nicola Rutt sent you. It's time to think club. differently. Uh, so E3 Consultants angles, Group, education, every one empower, in So life. when you see what is capable, uh, what, what, what the replay is really capable of, it changes your attitude about, you know, the calls that you miss. I mean, obviously, we, we want to know why, all right? I want to know if, if my positioning was wrong, if my timing was too quick, um, or if, I, maybe I just maybe I missed the play because I'm human and I'm gonna miss those plays. Um, but it is a, uh, a self-evaluating uh, process, you know. When when they come back and say, uh, yeah, we have to overturn that. But uh, the protocol itself is that the crew chief gets on the phone, gets on the headset, says, "Hello, New York, can you hear me? Uh, make sure all the systems working and everything." Um, as an example. Um, uh, the Reds are challenged in the call at second base, which is safe. Uh, the reply is, okay, we'll take a look at it. Uh, they look at all those angles and get back to us with the decision. So we really, we don't really have much input into that decision unless it was something like, uh, I thought he beat it at first, but then he came off the bag or, um, you know, something to that effect. Uh, but, but generally speaking, the decision is, is, is made in the replay booth. And is there any, is there any concern at all from the guy who, well, first of all, the guys in New York, is, is just one guy going to make that call in New York? Or is there, a, you said there's a, there's a crew of guys that are in the room, you know, That's is there true. multiple uh, there's guys? One, there's one guy, there's one guy who's ultimately, the, who, who is ultimately responsible for that decision. But, it, it is a consensus for sure. I mean, uh, there'll be guys that, uh, you know, you're looking at something and, and another guy will say, wait, I think he came off the bag on the backside there or something like that, and then I'll look at it again, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it's a consensus, um, but it's one person who's ultimately responsible for making that decision. Is there any concern at all about uh, if, if the guy on the field who made the call is a, is a senior umpire? Oh, an experienced guy. No, absolutely and, not. Okay. A- absolutely not. Our our total objective is to get the call is to get the call correct. Does it does it ever cause uh, you know humanness? You know, uh, you know, you think that you got it right, and you saw that you're you're standing there in the field, and and it looks to me it looks to you like, uh, hey, I've got that one right, and and it comes back, it comes sure. back the wrong way. Does that does that ever does it you know does it pick you off a little bit or? Of course, it, of course it does. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, you may feel that way until you actually go through New York and see and, and 
and see the different angles that they show. And invariably, because we have access to that afterwards, uh, able to look at our calls again, and invariably when you go back and look at the angles that they're able to see, um, you, you, you are forced to agree with them. Wow. Yeah, a few years ago, uh, there was a play. Um, it was about a, a, the slide rule. And it was, uh, you know, the, the, on the field, they called the, the, the guy going home, they called him out and it went to, um, it went to New York and, and they reversed it. And it was just one of those plays where I, I guess what, what made it really more difficult than anything, it was the first year, I think, of the new rule interpretation. Can, can you go over what that, what that rule is? Well, obviously, it's uh, you know it's it's been referred to as the Buster Posey rule. He hates that it's called he, he hates that it's called that, but um, that is how how it evolved. And the, the you know the whole intent um, is that you don't want the runner to leave his 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 running path, uh, not necessarily a baseline, but his running path uh, uh, in his attempt in his attempt to score. And if he deviates his path. Uh, and, and initiates contact, then he's going to be out uh, regardless. Um, there are, you know, and you, and you don't want the the catcher to be able to uh, quote unquote block the plate, and that's obviously up for interpretation as well. But you don't want him to be able to block the plate unless he is either in possession of or in the process of fielding the throw. Uh, so that's basically the 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 gist of the rule. Uh, but obviously there are different interpretations of it. Um, and, I mean, I, I understand uh, the fans' frustration. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a big Green Bay Packer fan, okay? So I, I, I see a lot of times where I can't believe how that decision came back. But with that being said, I mean, the, major, the vast, vast, vast majority of times, uh, if we don't get it correct on the field, it's corrected by replay. Uh, and, and consequently doesn't have an adverse effect on the game. Has, has replay changed, um, say, the skill set uh, of an umpire? And I guess what I'm thinking about there is it seems to me that that in the old days without replay, you could be umpiring the bases and, and you know, you could have something crazy happen at any time, whether you're behind mm-hmm. the plate or on the bases. And it seems today there's not nearly as much of that that takes place. Has that changed the skill set of an umpire in handling situations? Well, for, for one thing, the, the handling situations thing is, is, is that's an easy thing because there aren't as many situations anymore. I mean, years ago, a runner would slide in the second, you call him out, he pops up, throws his helmet down, he gets in your face, and here comes the manager, and you have a situation to handle. Uh, nowadays, when you call him out at second, all he does is uh, point to the dugout and put his hands on his ears, telling him to go to replay. So, so there are quite a few less situations that you know that develop because, in the first scenario, obviously a lot of things can change when you reject the guy and he goes crazy and you're back at him and all the things that that occur with that. And those things, those things, while they happen sometimes, don't happen with the same regularity that you know they used to years ago. As far as the the skill set, um, I, one of the things that I see myself doing for sure uh, is especially true on steel plays, you know, because uh, now you see a number of times where a guy will slide into the second and he's safe, but his momentum will cause him to rise above the base by a couple inches, mm-hmm. and, the, and the player keeps the tag on, and, and in replay that's reversed uh, to an out. So I find myself, you know, at least attempting to see if I feel he may have come off the base where, um, you know, before it was if he beat the throw, uh, you know, he was pretty much safe. But now I'm conscious of, of paying a much more closer attention to see if he comes off the base. So I guess that affects your timing a little bit. Exactly, exactly. Um, can you explain the procedure that you guys use when, when teams start to throw at each other? <laughs> uh, well, obviously, the, again, from an intent standpoint, uh, we want to try to protect the players. Um, there's no um, allowing the guys to get back at, you know, that well, he hit my guy, so I should be able to hit him and all that stuff. Um, our objective 
is to protect the players and to stop the situation from escalating. And, um, again, I can understand the fans' frustration uh, for that very reason because um, probably their, their best player just got hit and nothing was done. And then as soon as their pitcher hits the guy, there's a warning or an ejection and things like that. I can understand that frustration, but the the intent behind it is is to try to stop situations from you know from getting out of hand. Yeah, I think you and I and uh, most umpires, all umpires, and I think most fans would agree that umpiring is pretty darn good. But how is uh, well, it? Well, that that I'll agree. That I'll agree with you guys. You got me there. <laughs> How would is there a way we can improve umpiring? You know, we're all trying to improve whether we're coaches, we're players, uh, we're broadcasters. Everyone's trying to improve their skill set. How is it? How do we go about improving umpiring? I think uh, I, I think we're we've taken a lot of the steps to do that. From you know, we mentioned earlier that I've been around a long time and stuff, and 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 you know the. In the past, the case was when you made a call, if you were blocked out or the guy dropped the ball or whatever, that didn't really matter. You had to die with that call. Um, and that's not the case now. I think uh, we as, a, as as crews around baseball get together and discuss things far more than we ever did. Uh, and obviously we have replay that, you know, takes care of the majority of those things. So I think I think things are going in, in, in that direction. Um, I... Uh, I, I think there there's room for continuing education that we should we should look at, uh, you know, to keep things um, to keep things going in the right direction. Um, how how would you say the game has changed in in your thirty oh. thirty eight years? What have you seen? Well, I don't think there's any question it's the specialization of of the pitching. I mean, and and we're in the midst of a, a change in that regard now as well as far as you know, the opener and, and uh, staff of, of relievers and things like that. But, for you know, when I first went to the major leagues, if, uh, if, if you were in the bullpen, it was simply because you weren't good enough to be a starter. That, that, was, that was the reasoning behind it. Um, and now they've evolved from, uh, you know, why the uh, Herzog started the closer kind of aspect that, that Tony, uh, Tony La Russa uh, took to another level and, and – but now there's not only the specialization of, you know, um, a lefty versus lefty kind of setup, but now managers are recognizing that a game can be saved, doesn't have to be the ninth inning to save the game. You know, if uh, the meat of the order is coming up in the seventh, you bring in what you feel is your best matchup in the seventh inning instead of waiting till the ninth inning. So the specialization is, is what's really changed the game and, and consequently is what, Cause the lengthening of the games. I mean, uh, again, you don't you don't see pitchers pitching into um, the sixth or seventh inning that much anymore. And um, I mean, years ago the average number of pitchers was like five point two, and now it's eight point two. You know, when you have three more pitching changes a game, you're going to have longer games. You know, I remember uh, as a little kid, I'd go and watch Bob Gibson pitch against Juan Marichal or Fergie Jenkins, and you know, you'd have a two one hour and thirty five minute game, and uh, exactly. those are those are great days. Hey, let me ask you this: um, the future of umpiring. I mean, what do you see? More technology coming in? Uh, do you do you see what what's the future of umpiring as it comes to technology? Where are we going? Well, I think it's possible. I think you know those things are being explored. I know you know the electronic strike zone has been in the news the last couple of years, but you know the truth is is, is I, I think there would be a lot more frustration with that, to be honest with you. I mean, if you had a little, uh, you know, chip in the ball, uh, for for example, and I mean, there are pitchers at the major league level who can who can throw a pitch that will bounce on home plate and cross the strike zone. Um, you know, and and imagine that happening. I mean, there there are quite a few times where uh, a pitcher would would have to lunge for a strike, where now it's called a ball, where because up, uh, that ship crossed the plate, it would be called a strike. So I think there would be a lot more frustration if they if they if we did evolve into that. Um, but obviously, those are things they're looking at. So, you know, um, those of us that said there'd never be replay, you know, and you know, we don't say those things anymore. Are, are they going to expand expand the use of replay in the future? I don't know the answer to that either. Uh, I think. Um, 
you know, for the most part, it's accomplished what they what they wanted it to. Um, there are specific plays, interesting enough, that we as umpires want them to expand to. Um, but um, they, when they first implemented the system, it was, well, what are the plays that happen most frequently? You know, those are the ones that we want to replay. You know, so I, I think, unfortunately, what, what will occur is that it will take a situation uh, that's uh, on the monumental side, and then all of a sudden we'll have to – that will be reviewable as well. Hey, what does it take to be a great umpire? <laughs> uh, well, I think, uh, you know, the thing I refer to a lot is consistency. And the, the, the mistake that I think the average fan makes when we talk about consistency is that they, they think we're talking just about being consistent on balls and strikes and safes and outs and that kind of thing. Um, but I, I, I think I take it a step further into having a consistency of demeanor where, um, the teams and players, managers, whoever, know that if they address you in a civil manner that, that they're going to get, you know, a gentleman reply. Um, so they have to know where the line in the sand is and that it's uh, cons- on a consistent basis. So I, I, think, I think to be a great umpire, you have to have a, 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 a consistency of your demeanor. Hey, what, what is it uh, that fans don't know about umpires but you wish that they did? Well, actually, I think they're learning more. You know, I think uh, replay uh, before, actually, even before we used it as a decision-making process, replay when it first came, became available, um, just just for the fans to see the thing in slow motion, was very good for us because years ago when we made a call that went against your team, we were just automatically wrong. It was, <laughs> you know, kill the bump. Uh, but now, whenever there's a close play. Um, it, it's interesting because the mindset of the of the average fan, which, interesting enough, the word fan is short for fanatic, but the, the mindset of the average fan is that, you know, they're usually right. You know, they, they do a, really, a pretty good job and stuff. And one, to, to allude back to the, one of the questions you asked earlier about the process of, of when we go to the headset, I can't tell you the number of times um, when we go to the headset and, and they're showing the slow motion replay uh, on the re- on the scoreboard, we're looking in the stands, and half the people are saying safe, and half are saying out, and they're looking at it in slow motion. Right. So right. you know, so so I think I think the mentality of the fan has changed in that regard. In that, um, you know, they realize that that when we do miss a play, and the players are, are, have have really fallen into this category more and more, is that we miss the play because we missed it, and not because we're trying to stick it to somebody. And um, that's really changed the mindset, I think. Hey, Jerry, we, I know we've got some people out here uh, listening to the podcast. They're interested in umpiring. What um, What would you recommend? What do you suggest? How do they get, get involved in umpiring? Well, as I said, when I went to umpire school, I didn't even know there was such a thing. Um, and for those that are, you know, that are, that are thinking about it at all, I, I first would go to try to find out, try to find some high school or college camps in your area uh, to go and get a little sniff of it, see if, uh, if it's something that you think you might enjoy. Go to a few of those, and, and if you still have that, that desire to do that, I certainly think it's a dream you should pursue. It's been a wonderful career for me and my family, and, and I've been just so blessed. So if, if you believe it's something that you, that you want to do, then you should uh, look up and, and see about going to one of the umpire schools. Did you hear, what's the future hold for you? What uh, what might you be interested in doing uh, when the time comes for you to step away from from umpiring? Well, uh, I've become involved uh, with Little League International uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, we are in the process of developing a, a junior outreach program to to train junior umpires, uh, and I'm really excited about that. I think that uh, you know it, it's it's going to give me an opportunity to give something back to the profession. Um, by by training those that 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 are young and think they may want to be umpires, so um, that's an exciting thing for me. Is there any possibility or any uh, interest in in maybe doing some work uh, with Major League Baseball? Well, sure. I mean, I I know you know I know from my I know my personality well enough that I'm not a I'm not really a cold turkey guy where I can you know decide to retire and you know not be a part of it. So 
it's something that I would, you know, certainly uh, be interested in because, uh, I, you know, I want to stay involved in the profession. I love it. Any thoughts on uh, youth baseball? Any thoughts on, uh, you know, the amount of games kids play? Any any thoughts at all on the, on that subject? Well, I guess, you know, my – my perspective would come from, a, you know, from a from an umpire's point of view. Uh, one of the things that we're talking about at the little league levels, because we want to not only re- recruit and train umpires, but we also want to retain them. Um, there are several programs around the country that that require that um, managers, coaches, and parents be- become umpires and umpire a game or two in their respective districts. And I think that would go a long, long way um, to to helping the, the the parent realize uh what the umpire on the field is going through uh and, and put a different perspective on things for them as well. Yeah, I, I think if if you if they actually had to experience what, what the guys on the field have to go through when they umpire a game, I do think that, that parents and coaches would would yeah. feel and uh, a little bit different and treat the guys uh, a little bit different uh, during those difficult moments. That's, okay, that's going to be a that's going to be a main factor in in being able to retain umpires as well. I think uh, you know around the country there's a mini crisis now as far as having enough officials. I know there are a lot of games that have to be moved uh, to different days and things like that because there just aren't enough officials to go around and and uh, that's a byproduct of what we're talking about. We're, we're clearly not getting the young athlete, the guy who just finishes his high school career. Those guys aren't going into officiating, and, that, and we need that, to do a better job. Change. That needs to change, and, and I think uh, um, I, I think it would be incumbent upon you know managers and coaches to to you know uh, uh, do what Paul Fultz did for me. You know, uh, he knew I wanted to stay involved in baseball in some capacity if I could. Um, you know, I, I mean. Steer your kids toward that. If if they're not going to be able to be a player and they love the game, this is a great way to stay involved in it. Hey Jerry, listen, thanks uh, thanks so much for your time this evening and being on our our podcast. I know our listeners have have really enjoyed our conversation. I want to Thank just you. congratulate you on a on a personal level for your your uh, your 38 years. You've certainly had a wonderful career, and not only. Not only the the things that you've done, the level of officiating that you've achieved, but but really how you do it and how you conduct yourself. I want to congratulate you on a great great career, and I hope you have a, a many many more years. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it very much. Good luck to everybody. Hey, thanks, Jerry. Thanks again. Now and uh, and we'll be in touch. Okay. I really enjoyed our conversation with Major League Umpire Jerry Davis. We got a chance to discuss quite a bit in our interview. Instant replay. K-Zone strike zone box used on TV, and what it takes to be a good umpire. I hope you got the feeling like I did that these umpires want to do a great job and get the play right. That's the most important thing is to get the play right. I hope we remember that in the games we coach. All umpires want to get it right. Coaches, when you go on that field to talk to an umpire, Remember that everyone is watching. This is your time to teach the kids on your team and the other team how to have a discussion when two people don't agree. These are the teachable moments that we really want to take advantage of. Make sure you think about this beforehand so when the opportunity arises, you can handle the situation the right way. Thanks for listening and I want to ask everyone to please share the link to this Coach Baseball Right podcast episode on Facebook and Twitter.